Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, as you can see, I've got a microphone in front of me because we've got some online participants on Zoom as well, actually. Um, and we are recording this meeting. It will be on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, but obviously, there's no cameras involved except one pointing at Sam. Don't worry about that. Uh, for the Q&A later, I'll ask you to use this microphone as well, just so they can hear you online. If you'd rather not be on YouTube afterwards, just let me know. We can just cut that out, so no pressure whatsoever. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Samantha Salt today. Um, Sam did a degree in, well, a bachelor and a master's degree in Penryn and Conservation, and she now works for Borneo Nature Foundation, also based in Penryn, but has been out to Borneo um, several times, I believe. Yeah, um, like twice. <laughs> on the yeah, various activities. Uh, without further ado, over to you then, Sam. Oh, thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone online. Um, I'm sorry if I forget to look at the phone. I do know you're here, and I'm not ignoring you. Um, also, I hope that all the tech is okay because I have absolutely no idea what's going on. So if it all goes wrong, stay the spot. Um, but hi, I'm Sam. Um, I work for the Borneo Nature Foundation. Um, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about the work that we do. Um, we have a real kind of community focus with everything that we do. And we really believe in that approach um, to have successful conservation. Um, so that's what I want to do today. So uh, thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see you and some familiar faces as well. Um, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end, but if you have any questions at any point, just fire away. Um, that might make things more complicated for you now. We'll work out. <laughs> but we'll figure it out. Um, oh, and I, can, I can't figure out my slides, which is a good start. Um, <laughs> so before I get into talking about what we do at BNF, I'll just give you a bit of a background about me, um, why I'm actually here talking to you, um, and what's kind of led me to really believe in Borneo and why I think you should care about it. Um, so as David said, I did my undergraduate and my master's um, at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus um, here in Cornwall, and I did that in conservation. Um, and that was when I had my first experience with Borneo and with the Borneo Nature Foundation. Um, so I undertook a research volunteering exhibition um, with BNF, where I was lucky enough to go out to Borneo and experience all the amazing wildlife out there. Um, so I took part in some really amazing um, kind of research work. So I went out and I was doing orangutan uh, nest counts, um, gibbon triangulation surveys, which is where you're kind of identifying where the populations are based on their sounds. I'm on a really creaky floorboard here. I'm going to move away from that. Um, also looking at things like butterflies and moths that are just enormous. They're like bigger than the size of my head by quite a, a way, which is just amazing to see. Um, dragonflies, damselflies, and um, fish surveys, all of this sort of stuff. Um, so it's just really amazing to be immersed in the forest and kind of more immersed than you would like to be sometimes when you're falling in peat and basically just living your life in a swamp. Um, but when I was there, I was really lucky to have my first experience seeing a wild orangutan. Um, and this was a really magical experience because in the area that we were, orangutans aren't necessarily used to being around people. So it wasn't a given that we'd actually see them. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be on that research project that day. I was meant to be doing something completely different. Um, and then Wendy, one of the researchers, needed an extra pair of hands. So I volunteered to go out there with her. Um, and so during that time, we saw these trees kind of moving. There was this movement kind of, you could track it and it was coming closer and closer to us. Um, and then we sort of stayed really, really still. We realized something was in the trees um, and we just basically held our breath, stayed as quiet as possible. And this orangutan about sort of five meters away, probably the distance that you are at the back there from me. And it just came down on the floor and I was like, oh my gosh, like, it was just, I don't think I've held my breath for so long in my life. I'm surprised I didn't pass out, um, but it was incredible. And almost as quickly as it came, it left again. Um, but that was really magical. And it, kind of experiences like that really do kind of, for me anyway, make me quite emotional. And so it was a real kind of driver for me to want to get into conservation and in particular protect the um, rainforests of Borneo. Um, and I was lucky to go out again um, in last year, um, almost, well, it was over a year ago now, um, whilst I was working at Borneo Nature Foundation in my permanent job that I am now, uh, which is senior engagement officer. And my role is doing fundraising and awareness raising to get amazing people like you to hear all about Borneo. Um, and so this is me with the team doing our hydrology restoration and our reforestation work and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about now. Oh, I've lost my keys. I can't see where they are. Okay. Um, so I've kind of told you about the story that inspired me. Um, but the bigger question is why Borneo? Why should you care about Borneo? Um, and why should everyone care about Borneo? 
So Borneo is actually one of the third uh, largest islands in the world. So it's massive. I didn't realize this um, until I started working here, how big it is. And it's a biodiversity hotspot, which means that there are loads and loads of really important species there, lots of really important wildlife, but it's really under threat. So it's an important place for us to be putting our attention. And there are so many threatened species there, um, many of which are endemic or you, know, the, um, you can only find them there in Borneo. So some of these species include the Borneo orangutan, as the name suggests. Um, and in the sites that we work in BNF, we find some of the largest wild populations of orangutans in the world. But there are other species like the white bearded gibbon in the middle, um, the rhinoceros hornbill, the clouded leopard, um, and the Borneo bay cat and the flat headed cat. Um, we have five species of wild cat in Borneo, and in our sites we find all of them, and they're really understudied. So we also have a program where we're working to understand these so that everybody around the world can better understand their behavior and their conservation. And we've also got some very cute but aggressive uh, sun bears, which are just really angry, but for no reason. Um, but it's not just the wildlife um, that's important, it's also the landscape itself. And so the areas that we work in um, Borneo in uh, the Borneo Nature Foundation are peat swamp forests, um, one of which is the Sabangal National Park, which is where our primary programs are. Um, this is a photo here of the peat swamp. It's very wet, as you can see, um, and I'm sure many of you already know that peat is a very valuable um, natural resource. It holds a huge amount of carbon, so it's very globally important. In Borneo, in the areas that we work, we find peat that comes up to about 15 meters deep, so it's huge, huge deposits of peat. If these um, peat, if, the, if these peat forests, if I can get my words out, get degraded, that peat gets very dry. It's very flammable, and it's basically a fire starter. Um, so it's really, really important that we're stopping that degradation from happening. And so we are seeing these issues with fires because there has been logging, which has happened in um, the peat. And the logging, like I said, has kind of they've dug these canals, they've drained the water away, and made the peat very dry. We're also seeing uh, deforestation because of agriculture, um, crop growth, such as um, art poet, palm oil, um, which is one of those very common ones that everybody kind of knows quite a lot about, but other things like acacia as well. Um, and there's a lot of issues with mining, particularly for gold. So there's a lot of um, degradation happening in these areas. And because they're very important, it's a global issue. But at the Borneo and Nature Foundation, we think that global issues actually are best handled with local solutions. And that's really the approach that we try to take. So through our work, we have kind of four pillars um, of our projects. Um, first of all, our approach is to really work to understand the rainforest, the ecosystem and the species that we find there. So we have a lot of research projects working to understand both the wildlife and the benefits of our project. We then use this information to feed into our conservation programs and directly and actively do restoration and protection of the landscape. And throughout all of this, we have a huge emphasis on community development and community involvement and making sure that we're having um, giving support for sustainable livelihoods. And then we're also doing education primarily with children in local schools um, to basically inspire the next generation of conservationists. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about our flagship project, which is our reforestation project, um, otherwise known as One Million Trees. And with this project, as the name suggests, we want to plant more like one million trees. And the goal is to do that by 2025. And this is actually an award-winning project. So um, we won in 2022, last year, we won the If Design Social Impact Prize for this project. And we also, in 2020, uh, won the Global Warming um, Mitigation Project's Keeling Curve Prize. Um, and the um, One Trillion Tree Challenge, which is um, led by the World Economic Forum and the a People's Choice Award for that as well. So we are globally recognized for the impact that we have for the environment and also um, for society. And through that, um, through our reforestation projects, I think it's a really good example of why that is. So what we do to reforest our burn areas in the Sabangal National Park is we have a community nursery scheme. And so in this, we have local communities who are trained and given infrastructure to be able to grow seedlings for us that we then plant in the forest. They then help us plant the seeds in the forest. Once they're planted, we then have um, community firefighting teams who are patrolling the forest and protecting it from those root causes. And we're then also having a really long term monitoring scheme um, to make sure that the trees that we put in the ground are really succeeding. And so our community nursery scheme is really crucial. These community nurseries are central to our project. We couldn't do it without the local people that are involved. 
But it's really important to us that not only are we getting help from the local communities, but that they are also really getting help from us and getting direct benefit, whether that's financial or just kind of the ability to take part and really make a difference to the conservation programs that we run. And so this is Ibu Santi. She is one of our local community nursery members. Um, and you can see here um, from her testimony that she really can see a direct benefit from involvement in terms of education, training, um, and financial benefits. And we're gonna now play a video here for you. Um, hopefully everyone online can hear this all okay and you guys can. Um, but this is Sue Bionor. He is another of our community nursery members and he's speaking directly about his involvement with the project and what he thinks the benefits are. So I'll let you hear from him rather than just me rabbiting on all evening. stood in the way for the start of that. I hope you managed to catch most of it. Um, don't play it again. We don't need to hear it again. <laughs> okay. Um, so hopefully that's kind of given you an idea of how the community nursery members actually feel about being involved in the project. Um, and it's something that we're really proud of to be able to see the impact that we've had on the local people. Um, and that, as I mentioned before, is really woven into our projects. And so alongside the direct involvement with the community nurseries, we are also working hard to make sure that um, the people involved can use that infrastructure for other sustainable livelihoods and that other alternatives can also be developed. Um, and so with the infrastructure that we provide, we also provide training on how that can be used for permaculture, which is a more sustainable um, option for growing crops than the agricultural, the traditional practices that happen in Indonesia. Um, and so this is something that we see often is a very successful program and um, with many people adopting permaculture practices. In addition to that, um, the other alternative sustainable livelihoods that we work to um, support local people to engage with is aquaculture, um, ecotourism and honey cultivation. And in addition to that, one of my favorite projects that we do is we support um, a local women's group, a network of women who are taking part in um, this Purun weaving. And this is a kind of a Dayak cultural traditional um, practice. It's very skillful. Um, I went out there and we met some of the community members and I had a go at doing some of the weaving and I was terrible. And I created one of these and I took it home and I brought it back to my family. And my mum now keeps it on the toilet seat, not on the toilet seat, on the top of the toilet to keep the air freshener in. So that just goes to show my skill compared to these guys in Indonesia. Um, but these bags are really important because they're also another kind of link to our reforestation project where we're buying these bags from the local women. They're able to get independent income, which is really important. Um, and we're then using them to plant the seeds. So we put the seeds in the seedling bags. They're organic, which means that they're great alternatives from the plastic poly bags that are often used. Um, and they also increase the success rate of the projects 
and they help the trees to actually root in the ground, especially when you're planting in peat, which is quite wet, it prevents them from kind of just washing away as soon as you put them in the ground. So once we have our seeds ready to plant, um, as I mentioned before, we buy them back from the community nurseries, we've got them in our, um, in our organic seed bags and we plant them in um, degraded areas. Now these areas are actually quite difficult to reforest because they've been burnt, they're peatland, which has been degraded. It's a very challenging environment to plant. It's not an easy task, but we take it on because we know it's really important and it's the areas that aren't naturally regenerating themselves. So they need that extra bit of support. And so, as part of our um, community, as uh, part of our reforestation project, at the moment we have planted about 270,000 seedlings. We've got another 158,000 ready to go in the ground at the moment, um, and our teams are out there planting right now. Well, not right now because it's the middle of the night in Indonesia, but they will be tomorrow. Um, and so uh, we're on our way to our target of one million trees. And once we've planted them, we then have an extensive period of monitoring and evaluation. It's really important to us that we're not just putting trees in the ground, hoping for the best and walking away. We have a long term and a very kind of long term in terms of we're not ever going to leave um, basis in um, Indonesia. So we are there. We want these projects to be running for a long time and we want to see that the trees are actually having a meaningful impact and they're creating the forest that we want them to have. Um, and alongside that, we're also doing kind of biodiversity monitoring to make sure that the, the reforestation is actually impacting all the animals that we hope it will. So all of that work is happening in the National Park in Sabangau, um, but it's a complex landscape in Indonesia and there are lots of different land types. And so it's not just the National Park that we're working in. We're also working in landscapes where actually there are kind of permits that you can get to manage land. The problem with this is that often, Companies with more money will find it more easy to get these land management rights and therefore it's a challenge for local communities to actually get hold of those rights to manage their land. And so one of our programs is our social forestry scheme. And as part of this, what we're doing is we're helping local uh, communities within village, within villages to get these permits so that they can manage the land themselves, which gives them that kind of ownership over their ancestral land, which is culturally very important, but it also helps with the conservation of the land. So with all of the work that we're doing, putting community members at the very center of it, we see that we're having a really big impact and we are very um, hopeful that this uh, impact can continue. Um, but fires are a problem. And this has been a very kind of topical issue for us lately because it's been a very difficult time over the last few months. So in Indonesia, between kind of September and November, usually we have a dry season. And during this time, often fires can be a threat, um, especially as I mentioned with the peat being very dry and flammable. This year, uh, many of you may know that it's been an El Nino year, which means that it's hotter and drier than usual. And so the fire risk has been higher. And this has meant that our firefighting teams have had to respond to a lot of fires um, in the area. Fortunately, we haven't had any of our uh, reforestation sites impacted, which is really promising, um, but there have been some areas within the national park which we've lost. And so recently we have run um, our firefighting campaign. Um, and the idea behind this campaign is to really spread the word about the work that we're doing, not only as an emergency response, but all year round to kind of reduce the impact um, and the threat of fires. Um, so I'm gonna play you this quick campaign video um, from our recent campaign. Hopefully the sound will be okay and I will try and not stand in the way of it this time. This isn't a film about fire. Again. Um, so that was a campaign that we've recently kind of um, been wrapping up um, and like I said to kind of highlight really that although there's a huge amount um, of importance with emergency firefighting it's also thinking about how you can reduce fire risk the whole year round which is something that we really um, take quite seriously but again the whole point of this talk is thinking about how communities are really leading the way in conservation and our firefighting is a prime example of that um, so we at the moment have a network of 15 community-led firefighting teams which we support 
And this is again, loads of local people who are just taking part in this and really leading the way for action. So we provide training, equipment and support for these firefighting teams um, who act very quickly to respond to fires. They patrol um, on ground and um, by drone and respond quickly to these fires to make sure they don't escalate. So the drone technology is also an important part of our work because in heat, uh, fires can actually spread underground, which makes them even more worrying than usual fires. Um, and we term them zombie fires. Um, and this is because you can basically think that you've put a fire out, but because the peat, when it's degraded, is quite hollow, it can spread underground to somewhere that you can't see, and then it will pop up again somewhere else. Um, so it really is quite challenging. And this is why we're utilizing the drones, because it means that we can use thermal imaging camera to identify where the fire hotspots are, even if our patrol teams on the ground haven't yet been able to spot them. And then all year round, what we're doing is we're restoring the natural hydrology of the peatland. So we are blocking canals that were illegally dug for logging to get the water back in the peat to reflood it or re-wet it. And this kind of restores the natural fire resistance within um, the peatland. And so the bottom line really of everything that we're doing is that we really believe that people are the heart of conservation. We couldn't do what we do without the community members that really commit to the action that they're taking part in. But we also feel that we have a really important role there to support people to get involved, to give them real direct benefits um, to feel empowered to take action. And that kind of brings me to um, a close. Um, obviously, these are kind of local solutions and local action, but it always needs support from everybody as far as we can reach. So if you are able to give any kind of donation towards us, whatever value, that would be hugely appreciated. Uh, we do have a monthly donation scheme. So if you are able to, that would be amazing. However, money is not the only thing that helps us. And if you could even just give us a follow on some of our new social media accounts that we are growing at the moment, that would help us to get the word out. Um, we also have a newsletter you can sign up to on our website if you're interested to hear about all the things that we do. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to have a chat about all the different ways that you can get involved. And um, if you have any questions at all, which hopefully you do, then I am more than happy to um, answer. So thank you for listening to me ramble on for the last half hour or so. Um, and yeah, I hope you've learned something and enjoyed it.